Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this significant occasion here at Augustana College. What's in a name? The question is often asked. With the name Augustana College, many people make an educated guess that the college must be named after St. Augustine, right? Augustine, Augustana, sounds similar. In fact, the name Augustana is a Latinized version of a statement of faith called the Augsburg Confession, or simply, the Augustana. To make a very long story quite short indeed, the Augustana came about in response to a sort of command performance by the emperor, who by the year 1530 had noticed that there was a significant fuss happening throughout his empire. He told both the Catholic and Lutheran parties to come to the town of Augsburg in southern Germany and to bring with them a statement from each side giving their perspective on what the fuss was all about. The response on the Lutheran side was the Augustana. And it is marked by a conciliatory tone and perspective. It was perhaps good for everyone concerned that the author of the statement was not Martin Luther, but Luther's chief disciple, Philip Melanchthon, who was much more ironic than his teacher. Melanchthon proposed 28 articles of faith, about 21 of which, he said, there was substantial agreement between the Catholic and Lutheran perspectives. And these were not trivial matters of agreement. The nature of God, the meaning of the sacraments, the role of the church and others. With regard to these matters, we substantially agree, Melanchthon proposed. While the matters in dispute were such as the marriage of priests, the reception of both bread and wine in the Eucharist, the role of confession and other matters ecumenical in outlook, and open as well to interfaith understanding. Those who take the name Augustana, as did the founders of this college, are inherently looking for common ground, for peace, not quarrel. It's in our theological DNA. And Amy Rowell, who died in the flesh this past year and is however, very much with us tonight in spirit, was insistent that God's peace includes those at the margins of society, especially refugees. And among other reasons, many of them to honor Bishop Yunnan tonight, did you know that he translated the Augsburg Confession, the Augustana, into Arabic? to promote greater accessibility of that statement throughout the Arab world. We are grateful. I'd like to recognize our president, Steve Valls, and his wife, Jane, just for a moment. Steve has been a real champion of interfaith understanding, and uh, we're grateful for that, Steve. So Eric Rowell and Bishop Yunnan, our entire college community greets you with gratitude and congratulations upon receiving these significant honors. Welcome all. It's my distinct honor to have been asked to give the opening prayer. Ironically, the name of this prayer in my faith, Islam, is Al-Fatiha, the opening. I'll read it in English, and then if I might, I'll read it in the traditional way that it's read in Arabic. In the name of God, the compassionate, 
the most merciful. All praise be to you, O God, Lord of the worlds, the compassionate, the merciful, owner of the last day. You alone we worship, and you alone we ask for help. Show us the straight path, the path of those who, of those who earn your favor, not the path of those who earn your displeasure, or the path of those who go astray. Amen. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahi rahman rahim Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Ar-Rahman rahim Maliki yawmiddin. Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in. Ihtina sirat al-mustadim, sirat al-ladhina namta alayhim, ayr al-maqdubi alayhim wal-dhalim. Amin. The late Amy Rall modeled how to care for the least among us by being one of us. That is why the Pachaman Terrace Coalition chose her to receive its One Among Us Award tonight. Born March 28, 1971 in Bloomfield, Iowa, Amy Rall began working for nonprofits as a teenager. But it was through her work with World Relief Moline that the people of this region came to know of Amy's commitment and compassion for the world's refugees. She served as director of World Relief Moline from 2010 until her death this past March at age 48. Amy helped refugees to get settled in housing, obtain household items and other needs. She worked tirelessly to raise community awareness of refugees in our community and advocated for World Relief and the people they serve in times when refugees and refugee services were not always supported. Amy worked quietly and steadfastly, never seeking the limelight, only seeking to better the lives of those she served. The vision of World Relief Moline, which Amy carried out, was to work in community with the local church to help transform the most vulnerable people economically, socially, and spiritually. Friends and colleagues say that Amy lived the biblical injunction to love our neighbor, the neighbor being the person God gives us. She was also a devoted wife and mother. Her husband has said that she leaves a beautiful mark on the world. Her family and the many refugees whose lives she touched are symbols of that mark. The 2019 <clears throat> One Among Us Justice Award is presented posthumously to Amy Rowell by Bishop Thomas Arzinkula of the Diocese of Davenport and the Pachaman Terrace Coalition of the Quad Cities. In light of her lifelong commitment to peace and justice, for her efforts and humble service to help meet the direct needs of the refugee community in the Quad Cities, for her love and compassion for people in the greatest time of need, for her ability to change the trajectory for countless individuals and families, benefiting them for generations to come. Amy modeled how to care for the least among us by being one among us. Given on this 24th day of September, 2019, in Rock Island, Illinois.
uh, just a few words. Um, on behalf of the Rao family, I humbly accept this award. Um, Amy was truly passionate uh, about God's children and served them all to the best of her ability. Um, as we continue to miss her, we also continue to treasure her. Thank you. Pachaman Terrace, Peace on Earth, is an award named after a letter, an encyclical, written by Pope St. John XXIII. Unlike previous encyclicals, Pachaman Terrace was not written to a Catholic audience exclusively, but all people of goodwill. The full title of the document is On Establishing Universal Peace in Truth justice, charity, and liberty. Pachaman Terrace was issued on April 11, 1963. Pope St. John XXIII died on June 3rd of that same year. The encyclical was released only a few months after the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis, during which time the Vatican and John XXIII were working behind the scenes with Washington and the Kremlin to reach an agreement. It would not come as a surprise then that the document stresses the importance of negotiation rather than the use of arms when resolving conflict. On November 22, 1963, President Kennedy was assassinated. On March 12, 1964, Mr. Charles Tony, President of the Catholic Interracial Council, announced that an award named after the encyclical would be given to commemorate the letter and honor the memory of Pope St. John XXIII. He announced that the first recipient would be the late President Kennedy. That same year, there was a hope expressed that this award would be given every year, a means of honoring the distinguished efforts of many in the areas of peace and freedom. With the award given this year, there are now 49 who have received the award. Many have also been honored with the Nobel Peace Prize. One has even officially been recognized by the Catholic Church as a saint. There are many great stories and many threads that connect the award winners with each other and with world events and leaders over these past 50 years. Monsignor Marvin Mottet, the 2008 award winner in his own right, loved to tell the story about how he received a call from the FBI prior to the award being given to Martin Luther King Jr., how they didn't think it was such a good idea to honor the upstart preacher. We are going to anyway, was Monsignor's response, and they did just that. Martin Luther King Jr. learned from another recipient King was so moved by the lived experience in Vietnam of his friend and teacher that he changed his view and opposed the war. In 2016, his friend, the venerable Thich Nhat Hanh, was the recipient of the Pachaman Terrace Award. You may have heard the phrase, if you want peace, work for justice. Decades before he uttered the phrase, this person served as the Archbishop of Milan in an attempt to push back against communism in his archdiocese, the archbishop enlisted the services of an atheist from America whose expertise was organizing people in promoting justice in society. The archbishop is now known as St. Pope Paul VI, and his American helper organizer, friend, is the 1969 Pachaman Terrace Award winner, recipient Saul Alinsky. 
striving for economic justice so very important in helping maintain individuals' basic human dignity was championed by Dorothy Day, Crystal Lee Sutton, Cesar Chavez, Lech Walensa, and Sister Simone Campbell, amongst others. And they were joined a couple years ago by a theologian, Father Gustavo Gutierrez, whose seminal work from 1971, A Theology of Liberation, spoke not just of maintaining human dignity, but of the sacredness of the encounter with those who have been marginalized. Others have referenced their award recipient peers as having been their teachers, maybe nobody more so than John Deere. In his 2008 book, A Persistent Peace, John mentioned 15 past winners that he had traveled to meet and personally learn from. During his acceptance speech, he shared that it was only at seeing his picture among his teachers in the litany of the recipients did he first think that maybe his contribution to peace was on par with his teachers. Our challenge is to do as John did and learn more about the contribution these award winners have made. See the connections and threads. One not need be from as far away as Brazil, Peru, Poland, or South Africa. No, Manchester or Ottumwa, Iowa would work just as well for a launching pad to be a Pachman Terrace Award winner. But the award recipients themselves would tell us that whether or not one ultimately receives an award for a contribution to peace and justice, we all have it within our means to be champions of peace right here where we are. In so doing, we come ever closer to establishing universal peace in truth, charity, and justice. John F. Kennedy. John Howard Griffin. Martin Luther King, Jr. R. Sergeant Triver. A. Philip Randolph. Reverend James Grappi, Saul Alinsky, Dorothy Day, Harold Hughes, Dom Helder Kamara, St. Teresa of Calcutta, Bishop Thomas Gumbleton, Crystal Lee Sutton, Bishop Ernest Untenkoffer, George Keenan, Helen M. Caldicott. Cardinal Joseph Bernadine. Bishop Maurice Dingman. Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Eileen Egan. Mariette Corgan McGuire, Maria Julia Hernandez, Cesar Chavez, Daniel Berrigan, Jim Wallace,
Bishop Samuel Ruiz. Jim and Shelley Douglas. Helen Prejean. Adolfo Perez Esquivel. Monsignor George Higgins. Leek Walesa. Dorothy Marie and Gwen Hennessy. Arthur Simon. Don Mosley. Bishop Salim Gazelle. Monsignor Varvin Motit. Hildegard Goss Mayer. Reverend John Deere. Bishop Alvaro Lionel Ramazzini. Kim Bobo. Jean Venet. Simone Campbell. Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh. Reverend Gustavo Gutierrez. We Dad Akery. His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Born in Jerusalem in 1950 to Palestinian refugees, Bishop Munib Yunan is a worldwide Lutheran leader, an ecumenical bridge builder within the global Christian community, and an interreligious peacemaker, working closely with his Jewish and Muslim neighbors to help bring about peace and justice in the Middle East. Bishop Yunnan was educated in Palestine and Finland, studied theology at the University of Helsinki, and later at the Lutheran School of Theology in Chicago. In 1976, he was ordained at the Church of the Redeemer in Jerusalem. This began his long and faithful ministry within the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Jordan and the Holy Land. As a global Lutheran leader, the bishop was the first to translate the Augsburg Confession into Arabic. From 2010 through 2017, he served as the president of the Lutheran World Federation, a global communion of Christian churches in 79 countries, representing more than 70 million 
Christians. While serving as president of the Lutheran World Federation, Bishop Yunnan and Pope Francis signed the joint statement by the Lutheran World Federation and the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity on October 31st, 2016 in Lund, Sweden. That document commemorated the Lutheran Reformation and the historical reconciliation between the Lutheran and Roman Catholic churches. Some of the bishop's closest partners for peace and justice, however, have been his Muslim and Jewish brothers and sisters in the Holy Land. For example, in 1991, Bishop Yunnan worked together with Rabbi Ron Kronish, the director of the Interreligious Coordinating Council in Israel, to launch and lead what they called the Jonah Group, a group that sustains long-running informal dialogues fostering joint reflection by Christians and Jews in the Middle East. Bishop Yunnan would bring leaders from the Arminian, Catholic, Anglican, Lutheran, and Greek Orthodox churches. Rabbi Kronish would invite Jewish rabbis and educators from the Orthodox, conservative, and reformed Jewish denominations. Altogether, they would work and act together, worship together in one another's holy places and spaces, build friendships, and break down fear and stereotypes, one person at a time. In 2007, Bishop Yunnan became one of the founders and leaders of the Council of Religious Institutions of the Holy Land, whose main objective is to resolve the Palestinian-Israeli conflict through dialogue among Muslims, Jews, and Christians. The Council promotes an atmosphere where mutual respect and tolerance through vigilance against inflammatory and hateful speech and encourages the government of Israel and Palestinian, the Palestinian National Authority to continue working towards a resolution to the ongoing conflict. In 2012, he also joined other global religious leaders in signing the historic Welcome the Stranger, Affirmation for Faith Leaders, developed by the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. Bishop Yunnan has said that leaders of all faith traditions should confront the extremists in their midst by witnessing to the power of robust moderation. I love that phrase, robust moderation. He has insisted, quote, moderates are not wishy-washy. The moderate is not a person without an identity. If we are going to challenge extremist theologies and the extremist policies they support, we must reclaim the centers of our respective traditions. He has authored two books, a number of influential essays, and he gives lectures and makes presentations on peace and justice throughout the world. Just a month ago, Bishop Yunnan was elected as one of the international presidents for religions for peace. He and his wife were married in 1980 and have three grown children and now grandchildren. In all his work, personal, pastoral, and professional, Bishop Yunnan has been an active proponent of ecumenical and interreligious cooperation for the sake of peaceful coexistence. I welcome back Bishop of the Diocese of Davenport, the Reverend Thomas Zinkula, to make the Pachaman Terrace presentation. The 2019 Pachman Terrace and Freedom, Peace and Freedom Award is presented to Bishop Munib Yunnan by Bishop Thomas R. Zinkula of the Diocese of Davenport and the Pachman Terrace Coalition of the Quad Cities. In light of your long, lifelong commitment to peace and justice, you have advocated tirelessly for the recognition of the human dignity of all persons in the Middle East and around the world. The coalition recognizes your vision and your commitment to human rights, 
world peace, and the nonviolent resolution of conflict. It is clear from your words and deeds that you are a person who is deeply rooted in the spirit of peace. Your leadership in promoting respect for the dignity and culture of the people in the Holy Land and people all around the world reminds us that peace can overcome injustice. Bishop Yunnan, <clears throat> you truly embody the words of Pope John the 23rd in his encyclical Pacem in Terrace as a spark of light, a center of love, a vivifying leaven to your sisters and brothers around the world. Given this 24th day of September, 2019 in Rock Island, Illinois. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Your grace, your excellencies, dear students, Augustana staff, friends, sisters and brothers. First of all, I humbly stand here as a servant of God to receive the Pashem and Teres Award. I would like to thank you for those who initiated my name and those who believe in the mission Christ has put on my heart. I thank you that you have included me among the greatest cloud of witnesses who have previously received this award. My Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has taught me, when you have done all that you were ordered to do, say, we are worthless slaves. We have done only what we ought to have done. I was very touched when I received the letter of nomination for this award, as I have always admired his Holiness Pope John XXIII, and his prophetic work and words. Coming from the Reformation tradition, I consider Pope John XXIII to be one of the reformers of the Church in our modern times. He initiated Vatican II, which continues after more than half a century to bear a harvest within the ecumenical movement, interfaith dialogue, and the life of the church in general. For this reason, I consider it is a great honor to receive this award which bears such a great saint's name. When we read the encyclopedia Pashem in Teres today, even after 56 years, it's clear we are, regard, we are reading the Magna Carta of Catholic engagements in human rights. The basis of this encyclical was the theological doctrine of Imago Dei, the image of God. What a prophetic voice his was, not only within the Catholic Church, 
but to other churches and to other religions and to the world. Two significant theological ideas have come to me through this encyclical. First, peace is dependent on respect for human dignity and human rights. Every human being, regardless of gender, ethnicity, race, political or religious affiliation, is created equally in the image of God. For Pope John XXIII, this is the basis of a new world order built on four pillars, truth, justice, love, and freedom. Secondly, Passim Interis has linked the modern movement of human rights to the church's central mission. This means the church as a whole is called to carry the gospel of love and dignity in the public sphere, to defend human rights, including gender justice, is an integral part of the mission of the church, not a side issue. It's an integral part of the mission of a living church. It's the primary law of the church, not only to speak on the rights and concerns of the Christians, but to lift up the necessity of human rights for all people and all colors, all ethnicities, all ethnicities, ethnicities. We must understand human rights to be both individual and communal. Even if we celebrate the UN Human Rights Charter, we still stand in this world with many challenges and violations of human rights or on every continent, we must ask ourselves, do we have one standard of the imp implementation of human rights, or do we have various standard, double standard, one for the friendly countries and one for so-called enemy countries? Today, more than ever, Christ Church must be prophetic, raising its voice to insist on one standard of human rights for all people and implemented by all states. It's the concept of Imago Dei which gives Christians the evangelical call to defend the dignity of every human being wherever they are and whoever they are. The strength of the church today is at stake. Church members expect, expect that their clergy and community will challenge world leaders when human rights violations occur. Through social media and the internet, we have become more globally connected to one another. No longer can we ignore the needs the pains and the oppression of others who live far away. As we increasingly see each other as interconnected, so we see our human rights as interconnected, indivisible, interdependent upon one another. If no longer, it is no longer sufficient to insist on human rights only for one nation, for one people, for one religion. Lutheran pastor and theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer said in this way, the church is the guardian of the state. The church is the conscience of the state. If this is so, then the church and all its members are called to secure the human rights of all, as we are all made in the image of God. Because I cannot live my human rights fully if my neighbor does not have their human rights. This is a religious concept 
and a call from God from all of us. Some would say that Passim in Terris was written in a time of fear and cold war. However, fear and the threat of war have not ended in the present day. There may be no iron wall, but some governments, out of fear, have secured themselves with walls and fences. There may be no more Cold War, but as His Holiness Pope Francis and His Majesty King Abdullah II of Jordan have both warned, we do seem to be on the brink of a third world war. And there may be talks happening related to non profilation of weapons, but in fact, there is still competition on nuclear weapons, and nations still struggle to pass reasonable gun policies. On these issues, the church must stand up and say clearly that guns and other weapons are always tools to destroy and kill and end life. The image of God in each of us calls us to work diligently for a nuclear-free world and gun-free states. The image of God in each of us calls us to insist that world leaders to take immediate step toward general disarmament of all weapons of destruction, conventional, nuclear, chemical, biological, and others newly emerging. The word is much safer and more secure without these tools of war. We want a world which reflects the words of Jesus who said, I have come that they may have life and life abundantly. The fear of the other is the source of conflict, greed, violence, extremism, terrorism, and war. Today, we see how some politicians and groups use this fear to create an atmosphere of, of mistrust among peoples and nations. It's no wonder that secular populism and racism are infecting the world. The church can count, counteract this disease by inoculating our youth and our elected leaders with the gospel of love and trust, mercy and understanding, Christians and all people of good conscience can and should stop the spread of such sick ideologies as white supremacy, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, sexism, and other evils in our world. We are not powerless in the face of these forces. We can counteract them by clearly respecting and loving the image of God in the other who is different. The church can and must speak truth to power, working for peace based on justice, upholding the rights of refugees and immigrants, and promoting reconciliation based on forgiveness among all peoples. Peace and justice are inseparable, as are truth and reconciliation. When we seek to speak truth to power, we must often mean we are addressing the structures of the temporal government in our countries. Indeed, there is much to address in every context. Even in the developed countries of our world, structural injustices and inequalities abound. The current debate in Europe and the United States over immigrants and refugees, dreamers, DACA, displaced, is a clear opportunity for the church to influence both public policy and public rhetoric. We want to see the flourishing of all human communities, 
rather than reinforcing forms of male chauvinism, white supremacy, and populism. <laughs> the prophetic response to foreign policy takes us even further beyond ourselves, asking if perceptions of national security and national interest truly justify the harm our action may cause to the people of other countries and other races. How specifically could Christians more forcibly address the excesses of other global powers? Last month, I attended the 10th Assembly of Religions of Peace in Lindau, Germany, under the theme, Caring for Our Common Future, Advancing Our Shared Well-Being. This theme is very timely. In a broken world, how can different religions and peoples claim the common values of living together, accepting the rights of the other, working for peace, combating fanaticism, fundamentalism, and extremism. Extremism based on any religion is the antithesis of love, the antithesis of our religion. It is a blatant perversion of religion. It is the role of all religions to be prophetic and to work for an alliance of values and allegiance of virtues based on accepting the otherness of the other. It's imperative that all religions teach their adherents to see the image of God in those who are different, not only in ourselves. St. John teaches us those who say, I love God, but hate their brothers and sisters are liars. For those who do not love the, their brother and sister they have seen cannot love the brother and sister they have not seen. This is our call. Religious leaders must be the brokers of robust moderation, not agents of hatred. We must be agents of love, God's love as religious leader, and that's our only call in our world. Many politicians and NGOs are talking about freedom of religion in the world. This is a very crucial theme for us today. Freedom to worship and to pray as one desires should be a right for even human rights and in every country. Again, there should be an equal standard of freedom of religion for every person, every religion, every community in each country. Reports tell us that Christians are per persecuted in many countries, but Muslims are also persecuted in other countries. Rohingyas, Dalit, Yazidis, and others. Anti-Semitism and Islamophobia are spreading and infecting societies in multiple countries. As the church, we cannot allow the concept of freedom or of religion to become a tool to oppress people who do not believe like us, or to oppress religions who are not like us, or to oppress denominations who are not like us. If there is a violation of religious right, religious freedom in any country, then the international community must address such violations equally, and for all religions, not only for Christians. We cannot pick and choose based on our political or cultural agendas. The concept of Imago Dei pushes the world and especially the people in my region of the Middle East to promote the value of equal citizenship. I notice how in many countries, this principle is being challenged. 
What we need is no more division, but equal citizenship with equal rights and equal responsibility. We need democratic constitutions which embrace diversity. No citizen of any country should receive more rights or privileges than any other based on gender, ethnicity, religion, sect, or political affiliation. If God has created us equally, who are we to discriminate based on the otherness and the difference? I always have insisted that even if the followers, if one religion, are the majority in a certain country, the doctrine of Imago Dei requires us to advocate even more strongly for equal treatment of the minority, no matter how small they are in number. The equality of every human being is the guarantee of justice, harmony, and peace in every state, in every church, in every mosque, in every synagogue, and in the world. When people learn that I come from Jerusalem, I'm often asked if I'm optimistic or a pessimistic about our situation. It's true that the political situation in the Middle East, especially in Palestine and Israel, is very tense. However, I continue to promote and believe in a two-state solution with Israel and Palestine living by side by side based on the 1967 borders in peace, justice, equity, and reconciliation. I continue to promote and insist upon a Jerusalem that is shared between the three religions that call it holy, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, and that it must be shared capital for both Israel and Palestine. As long as I live, I will continue to teach my children and grandchildren my people, to see the image of God in our neighbors, the Israelis. And I pray and teach my Israeli neighbors that they will see the image of God in us Palestinians. Once we accept the image of God in the other, then we can mutually recognize the human, political, civil, and religious rights of the other with each other. Only then can the Holy Land become truly holy, a home for both Israelis and Palestinians. I may not always be optimistic, nor I am pessimistic, but I remain hopeful. I remain hopeful for the true hope has never come out of Washington, D.C., or London, or Berlin, or Rome. Hope comes always from the city of resurrection and the new life. Hope bursts forth from the cross and the empty tomb. True hope comes from my home, Jerusalem. And therefore, I will never give up hoping for a future of dignity, respect, liberation, human rights for Palestine and Israel and in need for the whole world. Finally, again, I would like to express my deep thanks for this esteemed award. This honor does not signify my retirement nor graduation, but rather will motivate me more to continue in ministry, boldly promoting the image of God in every human being. I pray God will strengthen me for many more days to advocate for human rights, freedom of religion, freedom of expression, and gender justice. I believe this is my evangelical call in this world, which I share with each of you. In a world that is in pieces, I'm grateful for the call to be an instrument of peace, a broker of justice, a minister of reconciliation, and an apostle of love. Please, 
Pray for me for this demanding Christ-given call. May God bless you and keep you all the days of your life. Thank you very much. Let us pray. In the name of our God, who both unsettles and inspires us, let us give praise and thanks. Tonight, we are especially grateful for the untiring and countless works of Bishop Yonan and the late Amy Rowell. In joy and hope, the pastoral constitution and the church in the modern world Pope Paul VI reminds us, peace results from that harmony built into human society by its divine founder and actualized by people as they thirst after even greater justice. We are gathered here as a community of believers who hunger and thirst for peace. We are all part of one global human family living together in a world that remains broken and divided. We join in prayer, asking for the strength and courage to change what is unloving in ourselves. May we recognize the call to commit to actions for justice so that soon the universal desire for peace will be realized. Let us always walk humbly, love tenderly, and act justly as we welcome the strangers and build relationships of peace with our sisters and brothers and all of creation. United we go forth knowing that if there is to be peace on earth, it begins in each of our hearts. Salam. Shalom, Fra, Paz, Peace.